on December 12, 1950. He grew up in Alpine, New, New Jersey, before graduating from Tenafly High School in 1968, before studying at the prestigious Harvard University, where he obtained his Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics and later his PhD in Applied Mathematics. He then attended the well-known English University of Cambridge in 1976, where he became a research fellow at Jesus College. He taught at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology from 1977 until 1984, and from 1985 until 2000 at Harvard University, where he was the Louis Berkman Professor of Economics. In 2000, he moved to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where Professor Maskin worked in a diverse area, areas of economic theory, such as game theory, the economics of incentives, and contract theory. His current research projects include comparing different electoral rules, examining the causality of inequality, and studying coalition formation. In 2007, Professor Maskin won the Sveriges Riksbank Nobel Prize for his work in economic sciences, in which he developed implementation theory, a theory for achieving a particular social or economic goal. Where normally this mechanism can uh, make for many problems, Professor Maskin found a way to ensure all the conditions are optimally balanced, reducing these problems. Professor Maskin is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Econometric Society, and the European Economic Association. And finally, a corresponding fellow of the British Academy. He's currently working at Harvard University, where he's teaching game theory and economic applications. The lecture topic that he's chosen, why haven't global markets reduced inequality? Please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Professor Eric Maskin. Thank you. Okay. So, so thank you very much for, for the welcome. Uh, as Mark said, I uh, would like to talk about inequality, which is a topic which uh, is of interest to many people these days. It's actually a topic that I've been interested in from a research point of view uh, f for quite some time now. Uh, I, I'm going to try something a little bit different from uh, the other talks, at least the other uh, talks that I've heard so far uh, at this event. I'm going to actually try to do a bit of economic theory for you, and I, I hope uh, that this late in the day, that's not uh, uh, going to be too wearing. But um, this is a topic which I think uh, requires some economic theory. It's obvious to us all that uh, in the last 20 years or so, there has been an enormous increase in globalization. And by that I mean uh, there's much more trade of goods and services across countries. Uh, you go to your local market and you see fruit and vegetables from all over the world. At, uh, no fruit is ever out of season anymore. Uh, and another Im important change is that now there is more production of goods and services across uh, national boundaries. Uh, to, to take one very humble example, uh, if, if you go to your local bank in Boston or New York uh, and you, uh, you pick up the phone there to, to, to speak to, uh, to one of the agents, it turns out that the agent is, is most likely going to be not in Boston or New York, but in, in Delhi. Uh, yet they uh, are every bit as able to help you with your transaction as, as someone uh, right there in person. So th this is just one small example of what I mean by the internationalization of production. Why has this happened? Well, uh, it, there's clearly been a, a decline in transport costs, which is which has made possi possible transporting goods and services uh, long distances. But even more important than that, there has been a decline in communication costs. Uh, it, it, it's now virtually costless to communicate with people uh, uh, completely uh, on the other side of the world. Uh, and 
On top of that, there have been some institutional changes, removal of trade barriers, trade agreements. Globalization has made many promises, or many promises have been made on behalf of globalization. Uh, in particular, it, was, it has been promised that poorer countries will prosper, or, or at least achieve greater prosperity as a result of globalization. Uh, and, and on this promise, uh, we've seen a fair amount of success, and, and, and in fact, uh, some spectacular success in the case of countries like China and India. But another promise that was made on behalf of globalization was to reduce inequality, to reduce the gap between the haves and the have-nots in, in poor countries. And here, I'm afraid that we have not seen uh, the same success. In fact, in many countries, uh, we've seen just the opposite. We've seen a, an increase in inequality as a result of globalization. And let me just take one example, uh, but uh, there are many others that I uh, could give you in addition. Uh, Mexico. Uh, Mexico uh, joined uh, what's called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in 1985. This, this was an agreement which uh, dramatically lowered tariffs. Uh, and the idea was to encourage more international trade, which it did. Uh, tariffs fell uh, on the order of 50% within, within five years. Uh, and there, there was enormous investment in Mexico from the outside. Foreign capital poured in. Many people benefited from this. Many Mexican people benefited from this. In particular, white-collar workers saw their wages rise on the order of 13% within five years. But at the same time, blue-collar wages, wages of workers uh, without the same level of skill and, and, and education, uh, actually saw their wages fall. Uh, and as I said, I could paint a similar picture uh, for many other countries in Latin America uh, and in, in Asia. Uh, well, you might say if the average well-being, if average incomes are going up, does it really matter that there is an increase in inequality? Uh, perhaps I don't have to justify being concerned with inequality uh, in this time and place, but let, let me just say a few words about why inequality matters. Uh, first, there, there's a moral argument, uh, the idea that we are, uh, we, we are all uh, human beings and we deserve uh, to be treated equally. And if, if the, the inequalities that I'm talking about have arisen uh, because of uh, imperfections, in the uh, economic system, then shouldn't we try to eliminate those imperfections? Uh, another argument says that even if you don't care about inequality per se, you may care about poverty. And, and if, if uh, inequality leads to driving more people into poverty, then uh, the, uh, for that for that reason, you might be concerned with inequality. And the, then a final, more practical argument is that countries which, ex, which uh, experience greater inequality also tend to find their political stability jeopardized. Uh, we're, we're, we're actually seeing this in, in, to, to some degree in, in China these days. There, there's much more. Uh, political unrest than there used to be because of the, the strains of inequality. Uh, now, we might ask, should we be surprised by the fact that inequality has risen uh, in poor countries as a result of globalization? Uh, and the answer, in fact, is yes. 
uh, because there's a very well-established theory in economics called the theory of comparative advantage, which says that exactly the opposite should have occurred. Um, and, th and this is a, a theory which has a long pedigree. It goes back 200 years. Uh, it's worked very well. Uh, there, this is not the first globalization that the world has experienced. There's, there have been many globalizations over the last couple of centuries. And in all previous globalizations, uh, the theory of comparative advantage predicted exactly uh, what happened, which was that uh, inequality would decrease as a result. Uh, but that's not what happens uh, this time round. So uh, l let me begin by, by saying why the theory of comparative advantage ma makes this prediction that inequality should decrease. Uh, and then I will try to say what's wrong with that theory. <laughs> Uh, the, the theory of comparative advantage is based on the idea that trade occurs uh, because trade occurs across countries because countries are different. And in particular, they are different uh, in their factors of production, what the, the inputs into the productive process. Now, factors of production uh, include labor, capital, lands. For the purpose of today's discussion, I want to focus on, on labor. Uh, uh, and I want, at, at least at first, to divide labor into two categories, high-skill labor, low-skill labor. Uh, one reason uh, why rich countries are rich and poor countries are poor is because rich countries tend to have a higher ratio of high-skill workers. Uh, compare the U.S. with Mexico. Of course, the U.S. is a bigger country than Mexico. It has both more high-skill and more low-skill workers than Mexico. But it, uh, if you look at the fraction uh, or the ratio of high-skill to low-skill workers, it's, it's considerably higher in the U.S. And, and that uh, goes along with, the, which, with a much higher average income. Uh, because the US has this higher ratio of high-skilled workers, it has what economists call a comparative advantage in producing goods for which high-skilled workers are particularly valuable. So computer software is an example of a good which requires really quite high-skilled workers to, uh, uh, to, to produce. Uh, agricultural products, for the most part, uh, don't require such a high level of skill. So, so Mexico has a comparative advantage in producing uh, agricultural products like corn, uh, where skill doesn't matter as much. Uh, to see how globalization potentially affects production, let's compare the world before globalization and compare it after. So, so let's, let's do a thought experiment. And let's imagine um, that um, we could go back to a time when there was essentially no trade between the US and Mexico. Uh, in those days, the U uh, American companies would have to produce both software and corn if American consumers were to consume both software and corn, uh, because it, uh, importing it from abroad uh, was simply not a, a viable possibility. Uh, similarly, Mexican companies would have to produce both software and corn. Uh, but there's a sense in which the U.S. producing corn is inefficient because the U.S. labor force is, with this high fraction of skilled workers is better suited to producing software, uh, at, le at least according to the theory of comparative advantage. Similarly, Mexican software production is inefficient. Uh, because the Mexican labor force, with, with this high fraction of, of uh, low-skilled workers, is better suited for, for corn. Uh, 
Uh, and there's a sense in which low-skill Mexican workers are actually hurt by the fact that uh, software is being produced on a large scale uh, in Mexico because uh, software doesn't need low-skill workers very much. Uh, and corn does require low-skill workers in large numbers. So to the extent that production is being diverted away from corn into software means that the demand for low-skill workers is reduced. Uh, and similarly, uh, the demand for high-skill workers is raised. So there's a, a, a downward pressure on the wages of low-skill workers because they're, they're not being demanded uh, by these software companies. There's an upward pressure on the wages of the high-skill workers because they are in demand by the, by the software companies. Um, and that's, that's the situation before globalization. Now what happens once the door to trade between the U.S. and Mexico is opened? Well, the U.S. will shift production from corn to software and import the corn from Mexico. And similarly, Mexico will shift production from software to corn and import the software from the U.S. What effect will this have on, on wages and, and on the demand for low-skill workers and high-skill workers? Well, Mexico is now producing more corn than before less software than before. It's importing the software. So there's a bigger demand for low-skill workers. Uh, that means that globalization will increase the wages of these low-skill workers. At the same time, it will decrease the wages of the high-skill workers because uh, Mexico is not producing as much software as it was. Uh, and therefore, as a result of globalization, we will see inequality fall. What I have just outlined is the standard argument that was given for why globalization would reduce inequality in, uh, in poor countries, in developing countries. Uh, and in fact, this story applied very successfully to previous globalizations. Uh, just to take one example, there, there was a major globalization in the, in the second half of the 19th century. It became possible to ship goods uh, across the Atlantic because, because uh, at, at, much, uh, at much lower cost because ships got so much better and faster. Uh, now, in, at that time, Europe had a, a relative abundance of low-skill labor. It was the U.S. that had the relative abundance of high-skill labor. Uh, and just as the theory uh, predicted, when trade between the U.S. and Europe increased, and, and it did increase dramatically, inequality fell in Europe quite significantly. But as I say, the, the theory has not worked very well uh, for the recent globalization. And, uh, and the question is why? Um, and the, because I was interested in that question, uh, I have been working in collaboration with uh, Michael Kramer, who's uh, an economist at Harvard, and at the uh, Brookings Institution. Uh, and the argument that, uh, and I want to show you our argument uh, in, in a little bit of detail, but the, but the basic idea is that this particular globalization uh, has made the internationalization of production central so, uh, in a way that previous globalizations did not. Uh, so I mentioned the, the Delhi call center 
uh, as an example of the internationalization of production. But there, there are, of course, uh, much, uh, much more uh, important examples. Think of computers. Uh, computers uh, might be designed these days in the US. They might be programmed in Europe. Uh, and then assembled in China. So, so uh, a, a large fraction of the world is involved in producing a single computer. And, and, and the same goes for, for many other goods as well. Uh, in order to talk about the internationalization of production, it turns out that we can no longer just talk about two skill levels. Uh, we need many skill levels. For the purpose of, of my discussion today, I want to limit myself to four skill levels. Uh, and you should think of production uh, as consisting of different tasks. Uh, there, again, to simplify matters, let's imagine that there are two tasks involved in producing something. There's a managerial task. Uh, the, the, uh, which is very sensitive or relatively sensitive to skill. Uh, and there's a subordinate task which is less sensitive to skill. I also want to suppose, as I did when I was talking about the theory of comparative advantage, that we're limiting ourselves, again, to, to two countries, one, one rich, one poor. Uh, the, the rich country uh, again, is rich because, because it has workers of higher skill levels. Uh, let me call these skill levels A and B. Poor country has workers of uh, somewhat lower skills, C and D, where A is bigger than B, and B is bigger than C, and C is bigger than D. And outputs uh, is produced by, by filling these two tasks, the managerial task and the subordinate task. You, 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 you produce output by matching managers and subordinates. Uh, but the amount of output that you get when you do that is going to depend on how good those managers and subordinates are, how, how skilled they are. Uh, and I'm, I'm even going to give you a, a, math, a little mathematical formula. Let's suppose that output equals the manager's skill squared. This doesn't literally have to be true, but, uh, but, but the, that is, it doesn't have to be the square. It could be the cube. Uh, but the idea is that output is more sensitive to the manager's skill than to the subordinate skill. Uh, so, for example, if the manager's skill is 4, the subordinate skill is 3, the output is going to be 4 squared, 4 times 4 times 3, the, the subordinate skill level, and for a total of uh, 48. Now, there are different ways that a population of workers could be matched together. Let, let's imagine that we, that we had a workforce consisting of two workers of skill level three and two workers of skill level four. Uh, one way that we could match them uh, is, we, is what I'll call cross-matching. That, that is, we could, put the, we, we could put a person of skill level three together with a person of skill level four. This person would presumably be the subordinate. This person would be the manager, and we could do the same thing down here, and we get a total output of, of 96. But another way that they could be matched is we could match the 4 with the 4 and the 3 with the 3. This time, uh, if you do the calculation, you'll see that the total output is, um, is a bit lower, 91. So we would expect, if we're in a, in a world which which is competitive, which forces uh, the more efficient matching uh, to be made rather than the less efficient, we would expect this matching to occur. But, th but 
this matching depends very much on the particular numbers that I've used, four and three. Suppose we change the numbers slightly so that instead of having four workers and three workers, we now have four workers and two workers. So, so a two worker is a, is a worker of skill level two. Uh, once again, we could, we could look at cross-matching, and we can look at uh, homogeneous matching, where we match the four with the four and the two with the two. Uh, this time, it turns out that the homogeneous matching is better uh, because it le leads to a total output of 72, uh, whereas this leads to a total output of 64. Now, all of this might sound pretty abstract uh, and not having very much to do with inequality, but let me, let me bring it back to the inequality question now. Uh, the, 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 the point that, that the, the abstract part was, was meant to make is that the way that workers get matched together depends on the pool of workers who are available to be matched. Uh, now, um, let me do the same kind of thought experiment that I did before with comparative advantage. Let me look at matching before globalization occurs and compare that with globalization after. Uh, so we have this rich country and uh, and this poor country, the rich country has uh, skill levels A and B, the poor country has skill levels C and D. Before globalization, that is before it becomes possible to have international production, we cannot have workers in the rich country matched with workers in the poor country. It's just too costly to do that. Uh, so in the rich country, we'll have the A's match with the B's. In the poor country, we'll have the C's match with the D's. But after the barriers to international production come down, mainly because of a fall in communication costs, it becomes possible to, uh, for, for an international company to hire workers from the poor country and workers from the rich country without those workers ever leaving their home countries. They, they, they can just stay, stay where they are because communication is so good. So uh, what we'll tend to see is uh, the relatively skilled people in the poor, co poor country will now be matched with, uh, with some of the workers from the rich country. That we'll see these matchings between B's from the rich country and C's from the poor country. Now, what effect does this have on wages? What, what effect does globalization have on wages? Well, uh, before globalization occurred, remember, the, these C workers were matched with the D workers. This was good for the D workers. If, if, if you are working with someone who is more skilled than you, you probably know this from your own experience, your own productivity is likely to be enhanced. It's always, it's always good to be working with, with skilled people. Uh, and so b before globalization, the, these D workers had the benefits of being matched working with C workers. After globalization, the C workers go off and match, they, they, they put their services on the international market, they're now matched with B workers. The poor D workers are left to their own devices. And we see that their wages fall as a result of globalization, whereas the C workers' wages rise. In other words, inequality has now increased in the poor country because of globalization. It's it, it, because of the internationalization of production. Uh, and, and so uh, I've answered 
the question I began with, at least in, in this uh, highly simplified model. Now, uh, if I were uh, presenting the, the, the full-fledged model, the analysis would be a good deal more complicated. The model would be a good deal more co complicated. But the conclusion would be very much the same. Uh, and, the, and the question is, if, if you accept this conclusion, what, what do you do about it? Uh, what, uh, it? If you see inequality rising as a result of globalization, uh, is there anything we can do uh, to deal with that inequality? Uh, and the model suggests that there, that there is something very important that can be done, which is not to try to stop globalization, which is probably a hopeless effort, even, uh, uh, even if it were desirable, uh, to, but rather to give the D workers the opportunity to make international matches as well, to, to, to uh, raise their skill levels through education, through job training, so that they now have the opportunity of putting their services on the international market as well. Uh, now, of, of course, that's easy enough to say. Education and job training, though, are expensive. Who is going to pay for it? Now, uh, we cannot expect the producers to have the incentive to do this, at least not uh, as much as we would want them to. And, and, and there, there is an important economic reason for that. <clears throat> if, if, if you are training me, if you're a producer, I'm a worker, if you're giving me job training or education, which enhances my productivity, that's going to make me produce more, but you're, going, you're now going to have to pay me more because I'm now more competitive on the, on, on the labor market. And so you are undercutting your own investment in me uh, by, uh, by giving me this, this job training because, because uh, some of that investment is going to be lost in the form of the higher wages that you have to pay. So, so we cannot expect producers uh, to have the incentive to do all of the job training, all of the education we would want them to do. We can't expect the workers to do it either. They're, they're too poor uh, to uh, invest in, in costly education. So that means that it's going to have to be uh, some third party. Uh, the third party could be domestic governments. Uh, it could be international agencies. Uh, perhaps even the OECD. Uh, it, it could be, uh, uh, the investment could be made through foreign aid. It could be made uh, through loans uh, from the World Bank. Uh, but the point is that uh, it's not going to happen by itself. We, we cannot expect the producers and the workers to, to do it on their, on their own. Uh, nevertheless, um, there's a strong argument for doing it because we have seen, un unfortunately, uh, in the last 20 years, that despite uh, rising prosperity, very dramatic uh, rising prosperity on average in poor countries, uh, a very worrying increase in inequality. Uh, it, it, by, by doing something about education and, and job training, we have a, a chance at uh, at least slowing that trend, even if we can't reverse it, and allowing the low skill workers, the D workers of, of, of this model, to, to benefit uh, from globalization. Uh, as well. Thank you very much for listening.